On Overdrive today, we take you along for a ride on the BMW S1000RR in its fourth generation. Check out the electric Volvo C40 Recharge and a more powerful Mercedes-Benz EQB350. Hello and welcome to Overdrive, I'm Sony Dat. A super bike with superior engineering, advanced technology, new electronics and of course more power. I'm talking about the BMW S1000RR now in its fourth generation. Rohit got a chance to ride this motorcycle an entire day in the hills. Here's what he has to say about it. Ever since its launch in 2008, the BMW S1000RR has been constantly updated, upgraded, evolved, etc. This is considered to be the updated version of the fourth generation of the S1000RR. Now in that generation, the S1000RR became more compact, but with the update, it's become more aggressive. You can see those wings, you can probably even see that visually it's a little taller, the angle, the geometry is a little different. All of that is coming from BMW's track learnings. They want to make it a more hardcore track tool. But in reality, at least in our country, with just two and a half race tracks, most of these bikes are gonna spend more time out here on the tarmac on the public roads so how does it behave out here in the urban wilderness let's find out the 2023 model comes with a more flexible chassis more advanced electronics revised rider geometry better suspension higher power and a more aggressive design BMW's move to a symmetrical front end polarized a few buyers. But with the 2023 update, a bit of the asymmetry is back with those offset decals and a bit of that radicalism is back with those wings on the side fairing. These wings are inspired by the 2020 M1000RR, albeit not made in carbon fiber. You do get carbon fiber, however, for the heel plates and more importantly, in the wheels. While the rest of the motorcycle follows familiar design cues to its predecessor, the cast aluminium frame has been drilled in multiple areas to reduce weight and to increase flex. Geometry changes include a longer rake and trail, a lengthier wheelbase and increased ride height. This model features updated geometry as well, so that also gives it a slightly taller seat height. So if you have tried your friend's older 4th generation S1000RR, this one's going to feel slightly taller, especially because of the raised rear end. Even the seat on this thing is not the most comfortable, but we'll come to that in a bit. So if you're planning to get one of these, now test rides are hard to come by, even the waiting period for this bike in India is slightly longish. But at least try and get to the showroom, perch yourself on the motorcycle and see if it works for you. Because this seat height, may not be to everyone's taste. Especially since the seat is broad and here on the M Sport model, it is simply a thin sheet of foam which is ideal for the track but not the most comfortable for long distances. The increased ride height might not be the only thing you will notice if you were to ride the predecessor and the new S1000RR back to back. The advantages of the chassis level changes may be hard to come by unless you are a riding god who can push this bike to its limits I'm not, but what's immediately noticeable is the improved agility of the motorcycle and how supple the new Marzocchi folks feel in comparison to the outgoing Saks. These two feature electronically adjustable damping and while they are better than the outgoing legs, the S1000RR still feels a bit firm even in its road setting. The dynamic mode dials up the stiffness so much that the bike becomes unrideable in our conditions always bobbing over undulations and making the rider feel like a jockey, floating a few millimeters above the seat at all times. But once you figure out the right settings for your favorite road, the S1000RR is a hoot to ride. The engine revs to about 15,000 RPM and while that may sound quite peaky for a lot of people, the tractability in the city is actually quite good. In fact, the tractability around slow corners is also quite nice. And when it comes to long sweeping corners, there's again a lot of confidence that the motorcycle offers. What contributes to that is a longer wheelbase that the new S1000RR now sits on. They've also made holes in the chassis to give it better flex. Now on paper, if you look at the specs, the steering geometry might seem a little lazy. However, the carbon wheels also make for very fast turnings. Of course, it's still not as razor sharp as a Ducati Panigale, but the steering feels a lot more neutral, which means that it will appeal to a broader range of riders with different levels of skill. Even the brakes are more confident than before. 
The Nissan calipers are a welcome change from the many Brembo brakes that we've been sampling lately on many European and Japanese motorcycles. These Nissan calipers come from the previous generation M1000RR and it feels way more confident than the Hayes calipers that we've seen on the previous S1000RR. Now since we are on the topic of braking, you also get precise control or multi-level selection for the engine brake control. The engine brake control will play with the throttle maps and the butterfly walls to fine-tune the deceleration offered by the powertrain. That precision can help reduce nosedive. The bike will shave speed rapidly if required and yet glide smoothly through the corners without pitching or upsetting its form. And that sublime feeling imparts confidence. So if you're old enough to know what I mean, this one stings like a beamer and floats like one too. Speaking of the sting, the engine is uprated to 210 PS, which is only 2 PS shy of the M1000RR. Needless to say, the power comes nice and strong throughout the rev range and you will never find yourself complaining about the lack of it on the road or maybe even the track. The power also seems manageable for most of the rev range, but once you ride past the mid-range and closer to the red line, all hell breaks loose and the rider god in you needs to be summoned. 12,000 to 15,000 RPM is the savage territory where the S1000RR's gentlemanly mannerisms end and the animal comes out. And if you are a riding god that can tame that kind of power without the need of electronic aids, then there is a new easter egg for you, slide control. The new S1000RR will let you slide into the corner like a WSBK or a MotoGP guru to target those final milliseconds on a lap record. But I call it an easter egg because the only way to activate it is by letting go of the traction control system. You need to have the skill to control 210 German horses with the traction control set to its lowest setting in order to activate slide control. And that level of skill or bravery isn't everyone's cup of tea. Therefore, the biggest advancement of the 2023 S1000RR is one that many may not be able to use. And yet, if I had to buy an S1000RR today, it would be the 2023 model. I would buy the top of the line M Sport model in a heartbeat because you see, it seems like 95% of the M1000RR at almost half the price. And that is a steal in my books. I'm going to sum this up in a rather simple way. You already know it's a fast motorcycle. It has all the electronics and equipment that you want on a premium litre class motorcycle of 2023. So in terms of value, I think it offers tremendous value for the kind of asking price that it has. But the thought I want to leave you with, if you were to pick up a powerful litre class super sport machine a couple of decades ago, go fast on it on a road like this or maybe on a racetrack, the thought that you would have in your mind is, I'm so glad I survived the day and lived to tell the tale. You would expect that in today's times, a 200 PS motorcycle like this would make that thought even wilder, right? But the kind of thought it leaves you with is, was I going fast or was it the motorcycle doing everything? Depending on how you translate that last line, you will know whether the new S1000RR is for you or not. Well, in the superbike world, the S1000RR has some healthy competition coming in from the Ducati Panigale V4S, the Aprilia RS V4, 1100 factory, the Honda CBR, 1000RR, Fireblade, the Yamaha R1 and also the Kawasaki ZX10R. I hope I've got all those names right and it would be an absolute treat to get all of these motorcycles on one race track. That, of course, is wishful thinking from my end, but why not, right? We'll take a very quick break here on the show, but coming up on the other side, we'll tell you all about the Volvo C40 Recharge. Stay tuned, you're watching Overdrive. Welcome back, you're watching Overdrive. The Volvo C40 Recharge is a coupe derivative of the XC40 Recharge. It is powered by a 78 kilowatt hour battery pack and offers 530 kilometers of driving range. Let's find out more about it. Now the Volvo XC40 Recharge has been quite the success in India with Volvo accounting for 25% of all luxury EVs now sold in the country. So it's no surprise that we're now seeing this, the C40 Recharge. Now the C40 is the coupe SUV version of the XC40. 
So it's no surprise that most of the changes are centered around here and it's really quite an attractive design. To start with, you have this nice sort of double bubble kind of treatment if you want to call it. It's of course an aerodynamic aid. And that continues with this heavily raked rear windscreen. You see the angle of it, it's quite substantial. And then you have this quite nice spoiler. Again, it does give it some aero efficiency. It's done up in black with this really low brake light here. So it looks really nice. But of course, what will first catch your eye are these tail lamps. They're much more stretched out than the ones in the XC40, much more swept back. And they have this really nice segmented look to it. And this sort of blank space, body color blank space in the middle, which really stretches it out. And then the way it pushes into the bootlet itself and this indent here, the white badging, it really does look quite sporty, quite a bit more than the XC40. Now, of course, this has come at some cost to practicality. And while you still have a reasonably sized bootlet, 478 litres if you discount this space saver wheel, it's still quite a bit less than the 578 of the regular XC40 recharge. Now because of this sloping roofline, the height itself is reduced by about 60mm and the XC40 recharge is marginally wider to it, about 32mm wider than the XC40 recharge. But yeah, there are other changes too. The door, of course, it's changed a bit from the XC40. You have this a sharper angle to it, this quarter glass is done up a bit differently. And of course, you notice these, they're typical of many EVs right now, these really smart looking, fully covered alloy wheels. Now, the front of the C40 recharge is nearly identical to the XC40 recharge. You have the same new shape for the headlamps, this crisper shape, which sort of angles in. But they're now pixel LED, so they look a bit sharper and of course, they'll function differently as well. And then, of course, the distinct sort of blanked out grille or fascia, if you will, with a large Volvo badge and this sort of air inlet to maybe cool the battery pack, that. And this itself is taken straight from the regular XC40, even the petrol version, with this arrowish design again with the small fog lamp inside it. Now, this is not as common as you would expect in EVs, but the C40 recharge actually has a fairly substantial trunk or a storage space under where the engine would otherwise be. And it's a 31 litre, so you can quite easily put your charging cables and maybe some grocery here too. So it's quite a usable space actually. Now in terms of the powertrain, it's got the same twin motor layout as the XC40 recharge. So it's effectively an all wheel drive car. And the outputs are fairly significant with 408 PS and 660 Nm. And it'll do 0 to 100 in 4.7 seconds. That's about 0 0.2 seconds quicker than the XC40 recharge. But really the most interesting stat here is the range. At 530 kilometers, it's significantly more than the 418 that you get in the XC40 recharge. Although the battery pack, at least on paper, is exactly the same at 78 kilowatt hour. Now, Volvo says this is because of the more slippery shape and changes made to the battery chemistry. That's what's given it so much more range. But of course, we'll drive it soon in August and we'll tell you exactly how much it does on a full charge. Now, this is what the rear seat of the C40 recharge is like. The stroping roofline expectedly eats into headspace, it's about 60mm less. But there is a sense of openness, mainly because of this really large fixed panoramic sunroof. Now, the C40 is still based on an IC architecture, the CMA architecture, which is why you have this central tunnel. So while space for three people is there, and as a single passenger here, you're pretty comfortable. The floor also isn't all that high, especially considering it's an EV. Yeah, there could have been more under thigh support in either case. The seat back angle is right, there's good cushioning. But the third passenger here will not have that much space for their feet. But this being a Volvo and their very strong focus on sustainability these days. Now you notice that the weather here is man-made and these carpets, they're made of recycled pet bottles. So there's quite a bit of thoughtfulness that's gone into making the cabin of the C40 recharge. Now look at the C40 recharge's dash and it's again very similar to what you get in the XC40 recharge. Again, it's made from the same recycled materials. It's an all black look to it. But the general layout has remained largely unchanged from the electric XC40 recharge and the regular petrol powered XC40. So you have the same 9 inch screen with the very useful Google functions, for example, Maps, Play Store, and so on, which also shows you in the quite minimalistic instrument cluster. Now, a noticeable change though is the fact that you get this topographic design theme on the doors and on the dashboard, which really does lend a different look to the C40 recharge. Now, prices for the C40 recharge will be announced in August with deliveries beginning in September. As for how much it will actually cost, we expect it to hover around the rupees 60 lakh marks. But what do you think? Would you 
pick this for a few lakhs more with its far more stylish shape than say over the more simpler, more upright XC40 recharge. Bookings for the Volvo C40 will start online in August and deliveries will start in September. We'll take a very quick break here on the show, but coming up on the other side, we'll tell you all about the new Mercedes-Benz EQB 350. Welcome back here with us on Overdrive. The deal from the three-row electric crossover from Mercedes-Benz has got even more sweeter. The 350 EQB now replaces the 300 with better performance and similar range. Have we caught your interest just yet? So I'm back behind the wheel of a Mercedes-Benz EQB. I know we are not driving this car for a comparison story because honestly speaking, there's hardly any competition for the EQB, right? The only competition for it comes from its own ice sibling, the GLB, and to an extent from the highly desirable GLC. But the GLC has stopped taking orders for a while now because there's a new one coming. Should be here by Diwali this year. So in the meantime, until that new car comes out, the GLB and the EQB have been given the task to hold the fort for Mercedes-Benz India in this particular price bracket. Now, these two vehicles came to the Indian market only a little while back. And, well, they aren't really the right alternative for a GLC, but with its three rows of seating, both these cars sort of pose themselves as a more practical alternative to the GLC, depending on how you look at it. Now, when we reviewed these two vehicles a little while back, I told you that if I had to pick between the GLB and the EQB, it would be the EQB because of the kind of performance, range, the kind of clean emissions that it offers. So that would be my pick. And looks like a lot of you buyers also agreed with me because the EQB happens to be the higher selling car out of the two. So Mercedes-Benz India is now making the deal a little bit sweeter on the electric because what we have here right now is the new EQB 350 formatic. You can identify the EQB 350 with the badge on the boot lid and the new design for the alloy wheels which continue to use an 18 inch diameter. The key fob has lost its bronze accents while the rest of the car's design remains unchanged. This means that you continue to get what essentially looks like a scaled down GLS which has three rows of seating, a smart and youthful looking dashboard with multiple textures and two screens which too are scaled down compared to the screens in the GLS but are just as feature-rich with the latest MBUX software. It also means that the driver-side AC temperature readout is still hard to read. But the instrumentation will show quicker speedometer readouts because the EQB 350 is a faster car than the 300. I was anyway quite impressed with the performance of the EQB 300, but the 350 pushes that envelope further. The 0 to 100 time for this car is 6.2 seconds. 6.8 seconds tested and that's quite quick, that's quicker than the 300. Almost 2 seconds quicker to be precise. Of course, stepping hard on the throttle isn't something expected of someone driving a practical 3-row electric crossover. But the quicker acceleration is addictive and aids with easier overtakes as well. Being heavy on the right foot doesn't seem to affect the range all that much either. This is astonishing considering that the 350 uses the same 66.5 kWh battery pack as the 300. Because the battery size remains unchanged, the charging times remain similar too. But what does change because of the additional performance is the range. It is marginally lesser than the EQB 300 on the outright range. Now, our tested range shows about 5 km per kilowatt for the highway and about 6.2 km per kilowatt for the city usage. So if I were to do the math right now, most fast chargers, say Geo BP or any of the others that are providing 60 kilowatt charging are charging about 21 rupees per kilowatt. So that means you can get that kind of range, you can do that kind of driving with about 1500 bucks of recharging in a Mercedes Benz. I don't think I've ever paid that little money for road tripping in a Mercedes Benz ever. Where the 350 differentiates itself is with the motor configuration. The EQB 350 formatic runs a dual motor setup. So you have the more complex, the costlier, the more accurate permanent magnet synchronous motor 
powering the rear wheels because this is predominantly a rear wheel driven car. So most of the driving is taken care of by this more complex motor. And the relatively cheaper or the relatively inaccurate motor in comparison to that is the asynchronous motor which powers the front wheels. So it only comes into power when it detects slip, when it detects that you need better traction. That is when it comes into power. So it does that job rather well. So here Mercedes-Benz is able to give you very good performance when it's predominantly driving in the rear-wheel drive mode. And then when there is need for better grip, you always get more traction from the front motor. You also get more performance. The combined power output is obviously higher than what the EQV300 offers and that clearly shows in the overall performance that the vehicle has to provide. Revisiting what I said right at the start, if I had to choose between a GLB and the EQB, it would still be the EQB. And now with the additional performance that you get with this car, without really compromising much on the range, the EQB 354MATIC is actually the sweeter deal. With that, it's a wrap on this week's edition of Overdrive. But remember, you can stay in touch with the team through Facebook, Twitter, as well as YouTube. And you can follow our latest updates on Instagram. We'll see you next week. Until then, ride and drive safe.